What I wanted to do was give a New Year's exhortation of my own this morning, and um, what do I think would bless this body in 2017? So it, it's one that I come back to often, but I wanted to start the year with this fresh as the body of Christ, the commitment from every member to be faithful as, as members of the body of Jesus Christ. And so during my time off, I had several conversations and read some different articles on what really is happening in the church in America. And there are just many different things going on, and there are many different reasons as to why. There's a lot of angles you could come at it. But one of my burdens is just really the view of the church in contemporary American Christianity. It's really fulfilled what Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, Timothy, in the end days, difficult times will come. And he gives a list of what will happen as just a picture of America, a day in America. Lovers of self, disrespectful to parents, arrogant, boastful. They'll have a form of religion, but they'll deny its very power. They won't want to hear sound doctrine. They want teachers who will just tickle their ears. The church will no longer be a place where truth is disseminated and taught and proclaimed, but it will be a place that it will not be a place where we come to hear the word of God. It will become a social club, a place that is like where I I, I spent way too much time on my break with my daughter watching the Hallmark uh, channel. (laughs) It's just sentimental and emotionalism. I I, I think I'll throw up if I watch another Hallmark. (laughs) Thank you. That's good. It, it, It just becomes a place to connect and feel good and to get a spiritual high, not what my brother Brendan preached last week about a reformation and a return to Scripture alone, the truths of the Gospels that are found within this Word of God. And so the church is failing as to what it's been called to be. The seeker-sensitive movement turned us from the truth to, to what do we want? What do we want as unbelievers in a church? And now we even use the phrase, I'm church shopping. The fruit is where many gather And it's just nothing more than a social club versus the body of Christ, manifesting the glory and power of God, uh, united, united into unity that puts the display of love, of God's love to the watching world. It just isn't that any longer. And the fruit of that is people who are narcissists looking for what a church can do to meet all of their felt needs. The church is struggling more and more to meet these felt needs because they're increasing and so few people want to serve that they got to hire them out. And the result is that many are disenchanted with the bride of Christ today. And they just have quit going altogether. They, They like blogs for church. They like live streams. They like listening to these quick sermons or these little five minute ditties that you pull up on your phone. And what they have done is they have left church altogether. The dog and pony show isn't keeping them any longer. And so 500 years later, we need a reformation. We need a reformation that the church says, I want to stand on the scriptures alone, and that we are saved by the grace of God alone. And it's through Christ alone, his work, his merits alone, and by faith alone, not by works. And all of this will be to the glory of God alone forever. And ever. And so we need it in our churches. And so that is the fruit of the churches is that we gather again with a power then to take the gospel to the nations. And my heart is overwhelmed to hear what Rick shared that there's some Muslims who have put their faith in Jesus Christ and are going to publicly risk their lives to be baptized today. That's what happens when the church is done right and it begins to go everywhere. And that's what we're praying for here at Southside Bible Church. So we need a revival. We need an awakening. We need to bring back what we saw in Titus, the last book we studied, if you're visiting, where Titus says we need, in the, in the church, we need elders who are being changed by the message of grace, by the way they lead their homes and the way they lead their outside lives. We, we need elders to lead. We need them to teach the word of God, sound doctrine. We need to protect the flock against false teachers, put out those who cause heresy, troubles, unrepentant sin, and then the body will be this safe place that, the, that you can grow and it can build up and you can be what we are talking about. You can build each other up. And then Titus said, the older and the younger, pouring into each other's lives and teaching each other how to live the life of faith. 
empowered by the grace of God that has appeared, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. And so this is a call to personal revival. Praying for God to stir your heart to these great truths to, to awaken it if that's what you need this morning. A call to join hands to come together as the body of Christ and help each other walk in these truths and these realities of being in Christ. What does that mean? How do I live it out? How am I conformed to his image? This is a corporate group work together. We need to gather we don't see the gathered church as I can leave it or take it. As it that's happening all around us, guys. It's, it's everywhere. It's the spirit of the age. It's happening. It's rubbing off on us more than I think we realize or think. I'm hearing about and seeing from conservative churches all over the country that the attendance sinking more and more, that the, the average faithful member comes two times a month. And that, that can't be what we're going to look at this morning in Hebrews. How many have lost their first love and therefore their first love for the bride of Christ? The place where God grows us. The church is the place where the gospel grows and works and goes to the nations. And so I'm going to call us to that this morning. In 2017, I want us to give ourselves to the bride of Jesus Christ, that we will do what God has called us to do in it, not just to be here, but to do what God says you should do, every member in the body of Christ, that we will do that and not just be lazy, sit back, apathetic people. May we not forsake the assembling together as becomes the habit of some. We may not be like the liberals but we have made the gathered church a lower priority than God has given to it in his scriptures. So may we all give the local church the place that God has called it to have in 2017. This might be a New Year's resolution for some of you, and I'm praying it lasts longer than your gym membership <laughs> that you started January 1. For others, it's just ratcheting it up. You're getting this. You're doing an excellent job. I'm so blessed by how many of you are getting this. So there's just a lot of different people here this morning. Some of you just keep running well. And others, you just need to repent. And you need to give yourself to the bride of Christ the way God has called you to. And so I, I want to go before the throne of grace. And I want to ask God to minister to each heart individually for what you need to get from this sermon. And that his spirit would work that into your heart. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and I thank you for a new year. Lord, I, I pray that every one of our hearts are sitting here saying, what I want to do in 2017 is to know Christ more. I want to know the living Christ. I want to abide, dwell, love, rejoice, treasure him, proclaim him. I pray that that would be every heart just saying, I, I, if I don't grow more than I did in 2016, it would be hell to me. Oh God, I want to be as holy as a man or woman or child could be this side of glory. Lord, I pray that you would stir our hearts to be just this. I pray then, Lord, what we are going to look at is how is that done? How it, we can desire that till the cows come home, Lord, but we need your grace and we need this word that we will look at this morning to bring it about. We need each other. We need the body of Christ to help us grow. And so I pray, Lord, let, let no one here this morning see your commandments as a burden, to see them as weight where they don't want them, to see them as you being mean. God, your commandments are to bless us. And I pray that every heart would see the blessing of you calling us to give our lives in the body of Christ. Lord, work in every heart in a special way by your Holy Spirit, through the word of God this morning. We, we look to you to do the work that no man can do. God, move in our midst, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, if you'll turn to Hebrews chapter 10. My goal this morning is that God would attend his word and awaken every believing soul as to the importance of their sharing, that word koinonia, sharing and partaking, being their brother's keeper in the local church as Cain and Abel. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, we are. And that's what I want every one of you to see. You are your brother's keeper. That you would make it a priority to attend the gatherings of this assembly. From Sunday school to service to midweeks to fellowships to prayer groups to everything that the group, that the church is to assemble. Not just attend but to function the way that God has commanded you to. 
the outworking of our gifts and the building up of one another into our head, the Lord Jesus Christ. So look with me at Hebrews 10. I'm going to begin reading in verse 23. 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. There are commands and imperatives in this passage. And what we have learned so much here at Southside Bible Church is that commands and imperatives always come out of what in the Greek is called indicatives. And indicatives are statements of fact. There's always doctrine, realities, truths of what God has done. And in light of those realities come the imperatives of how we are to live our Christian lives. And so I'm not going to just preach this morning, you need to come to church. That's not our problem. This, this is not a command to just attend church. That would be to miss this whole passage. That is not what I'm going to do this morning. This is much bigger and richer than that would ever be. There's an amazing context that this exhortation comes out of, and I'm going to just set it real briefly because we could be here all morning, and we're going to go through Hebrews for years, Lord willing, this year. Uh, the, the Jews, the Jews who have now, they've made a profession, and they've, they've believed in Jesus Christ. And then this great persecution started coming upon them by the Jewish community. They're now being persecuted and, and being put out of the synagogues and, and can't even be a part of the community. And so what's happening is now they're going back to Judaism. They're going back into it. And now the writer of Hebrews is showing you why you shouldn't do that. And he's showing the, the argument is simple. I'm going to show you the superiority of Jesus Christ. You can't go back. What you are fleeing back to are just shadows that have been pointing to this great blessed one who's died and rose on your behalf. He was the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament pointed to. Why would you go back when you have Jesus? Don't go back. First section, one, chapters 1 through 4. Christ's person is superior to anything of prophets. The prophets spoke in many ways. He spoke in his last days and his son is how he speaks now. Way superior to any prophet who ever walked. He's superior to the angels as they sit at his throne and they worship this Christ. He's superior to Moses. Moses couldn't bring you into the promised land. He's superior to Joshua. Joshua brought you into a promised land, but not into the perfect rest that you now get when you enter into Jesus Christ. He's way better. His work is superior in chapter 4 through 10. We have a new priest, a better priest. He says he's eternal, he's perfect, and he's sympathetic. He's way better than any Old Testament priest that you could go back to. He's a better, we have a better covenant. This covenant in chapter 8, it's not legalistic. It's internal, it's personal, and it brings total forgiveness. I will remember your sins no more. We have a new law, the law of Christ. I now love and live out this law. We have a new sanctuary now where we dwell in Christ. We have a new offering that is efficacious by the blood of Christ, not bulls and goats. And he says it takes away your sins forever. We have new promises which once were physical and now they are spiritual. We have a new hope that goes right within the veil. Just an unbelievable book that through Christ we have unlimited access to God. And the writer declares, my favorite part of Hebrews is now we can draw near to God. We can draw near to the living God through the work of Jesus Christ. So this is amazing stuff that's going on in Hebrews. The Old Testament worship, you know that. You couldn't draw near. And in fact, they were taught, stay away or you die. One person, one time a year, the high priest could enter. So they knew in that system, you just can't draw near to God. And that's what changes you is getting near to God. Getting near to God in a, when you're in acceptance. Behold him, we become like him. And so this is absolutely new and profound. We can get near to God. And that is what's transforming and that's what changes us. He is the presence in my life. And the Hebrews is saying, you have access, child of God. Now the million dollar question is, how do we take advantage then of such an amazing privilege? How do we improve upon it? I hate to even use that word. How do we improve upon it? How do, what, what do we do with this great gift? And that is what we're in this morning. I call it the lettuce section. I don't mean lettuce 
L-E-T space U-S. <laughs> this is the let us section. So in verse 22, uh, let us, let us what? Let us then draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts spl- sprinkled clean from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let, let us draw near to God. You're cleansed, you're washed. Conscience isn't guilty any longer. Draw near to God. Let us draw near in light of this great gospel. In verse 23, let us then hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. There are a million other things vying for your hope this morning. And he's saying, believers, we, we've got to fight. We've got to hold fast this, this hope that we have in Jesus Christ of eternal life with him. I can't drift. I can't start making my hope somewhere here in America, my job, my family, a relationship. I can't drift. I, I, we got to fight. Let us hold this hope without wavering. Don't get off from it. And the question is, is how, how will I sustain this perseverance? How will I keep this hope and not wander and drift from it because I'm prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love? In verse 24, here's how. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and to good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together. What is going to sustain this perseverance is the body of Christ. The answer is community. C.S. Lewis says, Christ works on us in all sorts of ways, but above all, he works on us through others. The transforming power of Christ is through community. And if you think Just your devotions will change your life. I'm telling you now, it won't. You need those, but that will not be it. Just going to church on Sunday saying, I did my duty and I went to church and I'm done, will not do it. You've missed it. God has designed a community for us to work out our salvation, to manifest the love of Christ to this onlooking world. I have grown so much by being in this body. I thank you. I thank you for this body. Uh, Friday night, I was just tired. I have a sinus infection, and I just had every reason to stay home from college group. I wasn't teaching. Skylar was, and I thought, man, I should just kick my feet up and have a little Ben and Jerry's and start my diet tomorrow. <clears throat> and I come in, and this, this young man named Skylar Holden opens up the Word of God in Philippians 1, 12 through 18, and He brings the word of God in such a way that it just broke my heart, uh, showed me the beauty of why we want to suffer, that Paul's getting getting the the, the bolts screwed down tighter in prison by people preaching from wrong motives, and he just is rejoicing that the gospel's going forth to praetorian guards and all these people, and just wrestling with, how do I look at my own uh, trials, my own burdens, the own weights, And, and it was just such a rich night, and I just thought there, I love Skylar Holden. And if I, just the way the body of Christ works and blesses, uh, your introduction was a little long. (laughs) I don't know where he gets that from. But it was just the body of Christ. I love it. And that is the way we're going to persevere and hope. We, We need to incite one another. Look at that verse 24. Let us consider how to stimulate one another. The Greek word is to to stir one another, to stimulate, to arouse. Literally, it means to incite one another, urging to action. Colin Brown, the great lexical scholar, said it means to affectionately incite. So let us affectionately incite one another to love and good deeds. Here's the mutual responsibility, to urge one another. What Skylar did to me is he made me want to love God more and get out and serve better. He urged me, he stimulated me to love and good deeds by using his gift in the body of Christ. And so here is your outline this morning. The writer of Hebrew gives us five principles of incitement. (coughs) Incitement. The responsibility first, it is the responsibility of all Christians. Am I my brother's keeper? You bet. It says let us. So I ask you this morning, who is us? Who, Who is us? Us is everyone who draws near to God through Jesus Christ. Every Christian. This is a call to every one of us who are believers. This is not just a call to the elders. It's not just a call for people who are extroverts. 
and it's not just a call for people with the gift of admonishment. This is the responsibility of the entire church. Every one of you who are believers this morning, put this on. Let us. Let us. Love for the brethren, the Apostle John says, is the sign that you have eternal life. If you have a new heart, you love the people of God. And I'll tell you right now, if you sit here and you have no love for the people of God, what you need to say is, have I been born from above? You can't hate your brother and love the God in heaven. And so that is the first fruit when you've been born again, is I love God and I love others. And so it should, I should be commanding you to do what you want to do more than anything else. It's, just, it's like saying to me, go eat ice cream. <laughs> okay, go love your brothers. It should be every one of you just saying, yes, yes. We all see the problem. The problem today is individualism. Individualism, it's just me and Jesus, and we've been taught this our whole lives, that that is the only thing that matters. The church is just a place to meet my needs. I keep myself at arm's distance. That's just where I worship Jesus. I have a personal relationship, and that is all that matters. I love Jesus, but I'm not sure about his church. So yes, God saved you individually. He united you to Jesus Christ, but he also united you to his bride. We are brought into a family. We are the family of God. You are one with all other Christians. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Paul said, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. So we've all been baptized into this one body through the Holy Spirit. And so I just want you to be honest. Do you care about the people in this church? And then I'll ask you this, is there any evidence to show it? Is there any evidence that shows that you love this body? That needs to be answered before God with judgment day honesty. Is there any evidence that you could hold forth that you love this body? Because it's easy to sit here and say, I just love everybody. Is there any manifestation that you love the body of Christ? Secondly, we need to be intentional about this. So it's, it's all of our responsibility, and, and it's got to be intentional. This will not just happen on accident. It will not be coincidence. This, this is intentional if it will ever happen. The Greek word here is, it says to, to consider, uh, to carefully consider. Um, it means to really look and and dwell on. And what I, I, at Christmas, what always blows me away is those people who buy the perfect gift. And when they give it to you, you can just see they thought about this a long time. It isn't like me when you're checking out and you see those little things on the side and you grab it. It's, you just say, man, they thought about this. They really knew me. They, they, they got into this and got the perfect gift. I, I think that's a little picture of the way to, to, to carefully look and to think and who can I love? Who can I help? Where can I serve? It, it just isn't just walking around with your head in the clouds. This is a very deliberate, intentional thing. I'm just going to read a couple verses where the same word is used to give you the, the flavor. In Hebrews 3.1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our affection. So to consider Jesus means to just look at him from every angle. Look at the glories and the beauties of Christ and just gaze and, and dwell at, at all of his excellencies. So consider it. Just marvel and look and check him out from every direction and worship the Christ. James 1.23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror, and he talks about carefully looking in that mirror. And, and back then, they didn't have the regular mirrors. It was just polished chrome, so you had to really get close to see yourself. And it's the same idea, to really get close and to consider and to examine something. This is a call to stop and think, to examine the saints, to, to examine the saints and be intentional and think about, how can I stir that person up to love and good deeds? I'm looking at their life. I'm looking at their gifts. How can I stir them to be more for the kingdom of God, to love more? Do you think this way? Is that the way you look at the body of Christ? Or are you a consumer who walks in, what can you do for me? There's a big difference. Looking at my community group that I go to, how can I lead you more into love? I enter those little fellowships and, and think that way. 
When I'm counseling, I'm taking notes, and I'm considering. I'm considering, how can I help you be less angry? How can I help you with your depression, your lust? Whatever it is you're battling, I'm considering what it is that can help you to grow in that. That is what we're all here to do for each other. And so I'm going to ask another fair question that will get to the heart of it. Is there anyone around you who you are thinking about how to help them grow this very moment? Is there anyone that you're being intentional about to, that I want to help them grow? I see an area that I can be a blessing to help them, them grow in how they love and do good things for the kingdom of God. Have you ever paused and given intentional consideration to the, to the single adults at Southside Bible Church? Single adults, especially at the holidays, most often feel isolated. They feel like I don't fit in a lot of times. And so the body of Christ, have you ever just thought, what is it like to be single? How can I minister to them? How can I help them be fruitful and faithful and diligent as singles in the body of Christ? That's not a lesser status. That is a beautiful status in Christ. How do we help you see that and blossom in it and grow where God has you? And so have, have you ever considered that? Have you ever considered someone who's divorced and going through the holidays and they got to give their kids to different places and, and all of those different things? Have you ever considered those who are spiritually depressed? I had a brother come up to me Friday night and he said, how can I help? I have a, a friend who's struggling with a, a particular sin. How can I help him? And what I loved is he wouldn't say the guy's name because all he really cared about was how to help him. So he wasn't gossiping through a prayer request. And he genuinely just, how do I help him? And I just kind of threw out an answer and it was kind of general and, and he just wouldn't let me go. And he kept digging. Wait a minute, how, what about this? How about, you know, he, you could just see this guy wanted to help his brother in Christ get through this sin so badly he wasn't gonna let me walk away with an easy answer. And I'm like, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. This will not happen for the self-absorbed. The self-absorbed people will never think this way. Your life is the only focus. No one's helping you enough. I'm telling you in Hebrews, get near to God through the gospel and he will set you free from self-absorption. What you need this morning is Hebrews 1 through 10. You need to get that gospel. To be intentional about how to stir up the body of Christ to love and to good deeds to be so overwhelmed with Jesus Christ and the gospel that we love because he first loved us, you will start loving. You will start loving and you'll forget yourself. You just won't always be on you. You know the blessed freedom of thinking about others instead of yourself? That's the gospel. That's what it's supposed to do. Let us consider, what would this do if close to 500 people would give intentional thought to how I might stimulate my brothers and sisters to love and good deeds. I'll tell you what it would do. It would have people in North Africa being baptized today. It'll have people in Chiapas hearing the gospel. It'll have people like um, Gospel Community Church today that's going to preach Jesus Christ. And it will, it'll have us here stirring up one another. It, it'll change the world if everyone will do this. I, we, we've got maybe half that get this. And there's another half that need what, what God would do with all of us laying hold of this. So let us have a regular, ongoing part of our lives to be this way. Thirdly, what is it then that we are to consider? Uh, let us consider uh, how to stimulate. Uh, how to stimulate, uh, it, it means to spur each other. It's interesting in the Greek, it can actually mean to irritate each other. Some of you are like, I'm good at that. That's my spiritual gift. I can irritate anybody. And it means to sharply confront, to disagree. It really means to, to give me what I need, not what I want. Put that in your notes. Give me what I need, not what I want. That, that, that is the heart of this. What do you need, not what you want? Christian fellowship. 
your sin, your besetting ones that shipwreck you, the ones you're most likely blind to, you minimize them and your heart's deceived about. We need someone who knows us to speak and tell me and help me with these bosom sins that I'm blind to. Give me what I need. Spur me like a horse, man. Just spur me. Be like a burr in my saddle in this area. I always hate when you get a rock in your shoe. Just be a rock in someone's shoe in spiritual ways. Spur one another on. Tell us what we need. Help each other. Get in. Stimulate one another unto love and good deeds. Let's push each other in 2017 to run harder for Jesus Christ than we've ever run before. Spur one another. Fourthly, that necessitates a consistent togetherness. How are we going to do this? In verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together. You don't have to really be a genius to figure this out. You have to be together to stir up one another, to not be moved away from the hope that we have. We've got to be together and we've got to help each other and therefore we've got to be open and we've got to receive and it's just going to take a commitment by all of us in this. Art Gingrich said this, this uh, gathering is it's the scheduled meetings of the church. The scheduled meetings for the church. When the church assembles, we need to be together to do this. This is community. Opening up and building friendships and helping each other in this journey. It happens nowhere more intensely, I think, than midweeks. And so Brian Rutland's not here with the youth right now. But he's over these community groups, and he's just done an excellent job. And we're, we got sign-ups, last day of sign-ups today. And I just, I want to spur you. I want to stick my spurs in your ribs this morning. I want to be a rock in your shoe, baby. <laughs> Go sign up. Get into a community group. Get your life plugging in and starting letting iron sharpen one another. We need to get plugged in. Uh, individual. Start, just grab one person. Let's meet once a week and read the Bible together in the morning before work. Just whatever it takes. Be intentional. And I've been preaching on this for so long. So some of you have heard this for so long. You're like, here's pastor doing it again. And if you'll do it, I'll quit preaching it. Okay? I'll shut up. So don't just get in the habit of forsaking, it says. You realize it can become a habit it can become a habit to just start missing church. And you always have a somewhat pretty good reason, but it will just become a habit. And it will build and build and build, and it just starts small, and it will become a habit, and you will start forsaking this. And you know what happens then? Your hope will begin to wane, because this is the means that God has given to stir this hope. It will drift, and it will drift so much. If you'll follow to the end of this little section, look with me in verse 26 of chapter 10 of Hebrews, I want you to see where this is going to drift. Why do you think I won't let go of this? Because I love you and I want you to hear verse 26, why this matters. It's very important. This isn't a little issue. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who's trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Don't be moved away from your hope. It's a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And it's not just the one who sets out, it's the one who holds out. And at Southside Bible Church, we believe every true believer by the grace of God will hold out. But these warnings are here like when you go bowling, when you're a little kid and they put up those little bumper paddles so the ball won't go in there. That's what these warnings are. These warnings are so you won't go in the gutter. And they're to say, wake up. It matters that we assemble and that we fight to keep our hope or you're going to drift and you're going to end up standing before the living God one day and it's going to be a terrifying thing instead of the sweetest thing that you've ever known. This, this matters. This matters that we give ourselves to this. I'm not a legalist. I'm not saying you can't go on vacation. When you get sick, I like when you stay home instead of cough on me. I know that work sometimes can call you in, and there's just, there's times. But what I'm talking about this morning is a habit 
where the church is forsaken so easily. And I just salve my conscience. Oh, I listened to a Piper sermon. Everything's good. Alistair Begg said, to be necessarily absent from the church of God or to be needlessly absent from the church of God is what we need to discern. So necessarily absent or needlessly absent is what needs to be answered. So I don't think it's a number how many times you come to church. It's a heart. It's a heart that gives yourself to the body of Christ. And I'm going to give myself to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. I'm in with both feet, my heart, everything. I'm not a pew sitter. I'm done playing games with church. That's what this is. And you miss things come up. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm not worried about that. This is a heart that the writer is calling as a result of Hebrews 1 through 10. So have you turned your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh? Do you love coming to church? Jesus shed his blood for it. It's his bride. Do you love it? I love it. You can fall into either air. You can forsake it. And the other thing I want to talk about is you can come legalistically uh, and, and you don't really like it. It, it's a, it is like a chin-up. I'm going to do it whether it kills me. And some of you will come here every Sunday if it kills you. But you're miserable and you don't love Christ and you don't love others. But you make it every Sunday. And you're a gnarly dude. That isn't going to get it done. And so this, the, there's a big difference coming here for the right reason. I was so glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Sundays are my high holy day. I, I wake up happy. Have I, I usually wake up happy every Sunday, don't you think? How many, probably five in our whole marriage where I woke up sour? You can say it. It's, we're, we're family. It's just Sunday hits and there's just a joy and an excitement. This is it. We get to come together. I love the assembling. Let people stir me on to love and good deeds. I want to stir them on. I love the body of Christ assembled. It's my favorite picture. Do not forsake the assembling together to hold fast the confession of our hope. I don't want to be moved away from Christ. To stimulate one another to love and good deeds. We meet to encourage one another. That Greek word means to confront, to help, to urge, admonish, counsel, strengthen. It's primarily verbal. It's an appropriate and timely word. We gather, we meet, we build each other up, we edify, we encourage, we pray with our mouths and our tongues to help one another. We are a bridge to point each other to the true encourager. I can't help you, but I have one who can. And so the only way I'll ever help you is if I point you to Christ. And so let's come and just be a bridge to every problem. Take it, understand it, love it, and show them Jesus Christ. It fixes everything. It's good. We're the people of God, and that is deeper than any earthly bond that we have. Let us take up the ministry of incitement to love, to see people love more, and to do good deeds for the kingdom of God. May we stimulate one another unto love and good deeds. Especially, he says, as we see the day drawing near. It's closer than when we first believed. And so we can't let each other drift in these end days. What's your game plan for the end times getting harder and harder? I pray it's the body of Christ. We're going to need each other to get through these days. It's going to heat up and it's going to get intense. So as we see this day drawing near, we, we can't give up meeting together. We need each other. We've got to assemble and keep each other's hope fixed until we breathe our very last breath or Lord Jesus comes back. Let's commit to it. In 2017, may we not follow our culture and contemporary Christianity and drift from the church of God, but give ourselves to this local assembly consistent and faithfully and stir each other up unto love and good deeds. We will give ourselves to all kinds of resolutions at the new year. I'm amazed at the resolutions, and we will beat our bodies in so many ways to try to fix them for all the sin. But the most important thing ever, guys, is eternity. And I'll never get why we're more worried about the battle of the bulge than the battle of our hope. And so what I'm going to ask is that you will make some real resolutions as we start this new year. Will you resolve before God? to give yourself to his bride, to love it and to serve it and to be at the gatherings and to be your brother's keepers and not let anybody's hope wane in this church. That is so much better than losing a few pounds or lowering your blood sugar levels. 
So I'm going to ask you as one of your elders and uh, unified with the whole elder board as in 2017 that we would resolve to give ourselves wholeheartedly to this. And again, I'm so blessed by how I was just sitting there praying before the service and the sound of the fellowship was like just birds singing to me. It was so sweet and beautiful. And everywhere I go, I'm just hearing and seeing ways you're loving one another and caring and praying and pouring into and giving to needs. It's beautiful. And so I, I, I say with Paul, excel still more. And, and then those who you're just not getting it, you're just not getting it, go home and read Hebrews 1 through 10, and you tell me if that deserves a response where you come to church and leave. And so let, let's, let's get our hearts, all of us, all of us pulling and tugging the same way so that God will get all the glory and the church will function and do what it's supposed to do in the advancement of the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. I feel like taking questions, but it's late. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, it's, it's good to be back. If I stepped on your toes a little bit, I'm kind of bottled up and I just love you. So I didn't mean to really step on them. I meant to jump all over them and kind of <laughs> put my heel in there and put a few rocks in your shoes and all that. So let, let's, this is for your good. God gives you commands to bless you, not to hurt you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and I thank you for this body. God, I love them so much. I love that they love you. I love that they point me to you. God, I'm so thankful for it. I, I just know I can die well here. This group will point me to Jesus till I quit breathing my last. Thank you for giving me such a safe refuge. You gave me Jesus Christ and your Holy Spirit and your word, and then you gave me the body of Christ. God, let everyone here treasure it. Let us be glad when we come into the gathering together. God, uh, help us to, to really become those who will consider, will look at each other and see each other's gifts. And how can we help and stir each other up to love and good deeds? Lord, help us to just really be discerning by your spirit and to, to say the things that we need and not just what we want. God, help us to be faithful brothers and sisters, to speak truth and love with each other. Lord, use this body to grow us up into the head. We so badly want to reflect Jesus Christ, and so we look to you to keep doing that good work in our midst. Thank you for so much faithfulness that I get to observe and watch on a daily basis, God. It's a, a mirror and a picture and the beauty of your grace and your love to this body. So, Lord, we, we praise you. We thank you. We, we, we resolve with none of our own strength. We resolve asking you for grace to give ourselves to this body the way that you want us to. So, God, minister that into each one of our hearts, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.